This is Zev Ash and the Entrepreneur Next Door podcast, and it's my pleasure to welcome John Lee. John, one minute or so, who are you? Who am I? Thank, thanks. Uh, excited to be here, Zev. So my name is John. I'm one of the co-founders of PickFu, a uh, do-it-yourself customer research platform. Um, and I've been an entrepreneur for over a dozen years. Perfect. All right. So what I like to do, John, is um, j jump into a time machine, dial it back. All right. I bump into you in on the West Coast. I'm assuming that's where you grew up. Is that yep. is that okay? I'm bumping. Yeah, I grew up near San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Uh, and I say, hey, John, you're 15, 16. What do you want to be when you grow up? Did you know what the answer was? Uh, when I was 15 or 16, I did not actually. Um, but I. I always had an interest in technology and computers. Uh, before I discovered computers, I think I wanted to become Indiana Jones as when I was young. <laughs> Knew uh, every dinosaur uh, I could read about in the library. But uh, as a teenager, I discovered computers um, pretty early on in my teenage years and got completely hooked. And so I knew I wanted to do something with technology. Where were your parents techies or were no, they entrepreneurs? No, my no, my parents were immigrants. Um, they immigrated, um, yeah, right before I was born, and so uh, they worked. Uh, they worked manual labor jobs, actually. So I saw the. I grew up uh, seeing them work really, really hard, and I remember um, when I was about twelve or thirteen, my mom got her first computer, and I think that was pretty early on in those computing years, um, and that was my introduction to personal computing. So I basically just sat there and read the manual cover to cover started playing with it and that's how things get started what do you remember what well what computer that was yeah it was a 486 sx 25 uh I, think, I forgot how much ram there was but it came installed with microsoft uh ms dos 6.2 oh my god so so i spent my formative years reading the dos manual yeah yes. yeah yes. that's the very exciting i was very very popular teenager as you could imagine yeah and uh, <laughs> one of the most uh, dangerous commands to put in the old dos world was format star dot star format star dot star with like the proper with the proper flags and everything yep yeah which which to the youngsters on in my audience who don't know what dos is uh that basically means you're about to wipe your hard disk exactly and there's no, and there's no coming back from it. They may not know what a hard disk is either. Oh, so. oh you're right. Yeah. <laughs> the, whatever that that storage device that was inside that, the metal box. The plate that was spinning inside your metal yeah. box, right? Yeah. All right. So um, you go to Berkeley. Yes. Which interestingly, I, I'm, I'm from Israel originally, and I applied to Berkeley. Not really. I applied to 12 different schools. Had no idea what they were in terms uh -huh. of ranking. <clears throat> but Berkeley was one of the ones I got accepted to. I had no awesome. clue. I mean, NYU, you know, it's like a kid from Israel. I'm going to apply. That's They're awesome. going to accept me. No idea what the what that meant from a commitment and financial uh, yeah. uh, responsibility. But um, Berkeley is not an Ivy League school, but it's highly regarded, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. So you guys are next door to Stanford, which is like, I guess, your arch nemesis. It is our arch nemesis. Yes. Okay. Yes, Berkeley, so, uh, Berkeley has consistently been uh, probably the top ranked public university in the US. So Yeah. So I, to, to set this up as a, as a background, you go to Berkeley and you pursue electrical engineering. And was it a minor in computer science? Uh, it's a dual major program. Dual so major. it's both electrical engineering and computer science. Okay, so the two, well, I, I would guess that the two are, well, they are related, but they're not the same, right? If you want to be an electrical engineer, yeah, you could go one way. If you want to be yeah. a, geek, a computer geek, you go another way. Exactly. And um, going in, you it was just a joint program that you had to apply apply to get into. Uh, once you were in, you, there were numerous there were numerous tracks within that major, so you could veer more towards the electrical engineering side, maybe even like bioengineering, uh, you know, stuff, and then hardcore uh, mm -hmm. pure computer science. And so I definitely went the more computer science route. 
Okay. So then you you scratched the lotto ticket and your first job is with Microsoft? Yes, that's right. That That's a good way of putting it. Yes. Okay. So yeah. that's uh, 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, John, you look like a, I mean, you probably get, probably people ask for your ID when you go to a bar because you're like a really young guy. Uh, thanks thanks the the um the zoom touch up your appearance works really well nowadays right <laughs> uh, there's there's so much you can do but still i yes. can't hide this white i mean i could but <laughs> so um, that's john yeah, that's yeah. 22 years ago man yes that's right um so uh, just curious i'm sure everybody and their third cousin 16 time removed wants to work for microsoft okay you nailed the job. Uh, do you remember how how'd you manage to get in there? Was it a recruit from Berkeley? Uh, yeah, I was a recruiter at Berkeley. Um, what was the process like? There was some uh, there were some initial phone screens, and then back then, yeah, candidates got flown up to Seattle Redmond to have an on campus right. interview. At the time, it was a I think it still is nowadays. It's a full uh, full day of interviews with a lot of different people on the teams. Um, yeah, it was a it was a thorough process, I would say. So, I, in terms of timeline, I don't remember where Microsoft was at that time. But mm -hmm. two thousand is sort of like the year I've always referred to as the 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 official birth of the internet, where things actually started to click, even yeah. though it was it, it started in the late 90s but 2000 sort of like a good benchmark yeah 2001 where was microsoft at the time because i can't remember yeah it's i mean it's hard for me to remember now too um from what i recall microsoft was in a pretty dominant position in the tech industry uh google was just getting started just becoming a name i think um most computers the vast majority of computers were still pcs I believe the current version of Windows at the time was Windows 7, Windows XP to Windows 7. Um, yeah, so it was, it was in a very dominant tech position. I think what was more interesting at the time was that um, that was also at the time of the first dot-com crash. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated, um, going through college, we got to see a lot of our upperclassmen peers graduate a year or two before us and get really lucrative lucrative jobs in these hot high-flying startups like um i don't know what, what were the ones that pets cosmo you, you know some like, like really well-known brands at the time um right in the middle of the boom and then in when oh one when we graduated that's when things just completely crashed mm -hmm. and so it was an interesting experience interviewing uh out of college as the economy, um, and particularly the tech economy, was kind of crashing around. Um, and so Microsoft felt like a very good place to go uh, at that time. Interesting, because, you know, if we fast forward to today, yeah, watch all these tech guys shed off the excess fat they hired during COVID. Yes. Uh, and so back then, uh, well, I'm, I'm assuming they were they knew where they were going and then continuously invested in that vision. Yeah. So the crash was not something that really, maybe it affected them, but not as much as everybody else in the dot com. Right. So right. so you spend about four and a half years with them, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, and what's, in looking back, because most of us don't get to work for giants like that i mean i worked for ibm when i was in grad school but different experience um mm -hmm. what what's the biggest thing you took away from a four years at microsoft hmm yeah, such a wonderful question um i came away inspired that um there could be so many really smart and capable people um, all in one place. I think I think if you look at the trajectory of Microsoft, I think during those years from maybe 2000 till 2010, I think until Balmer left and uh, Nadella took over whenever that was, um, it it looked like a period of stagnation. But I will say that from the inside, 
that Microsoft has some amazing hiring standards and really brings in some of the brightest people around. And so that was very inspiring to be able to work with really, really capable people. Um, one of the takeaways of that was that even if you have really, really capable people, you can still have an organization that might um, might have a lot of dysfunction, depending on how uh, depending on how the organization is structured, uh, the guidance. I mean, it felt it felt like our division was being reorged constantly, mm -hmm. and that led to a lot of challenges of being able to maintain uh, being able to maintain sort of work velocity and output. Uh, making sure that morale is high and so on. Um, so to add one piece to that, the uh, the group that I worked in was the smartphone pocket PC group, was the, mo the Windows mobile devices group, wow. which at the time was actually um, the largest mobile device OS in the world. This was all pre-iPhone. So, and then mm -hmm. the iPhone came out and, you know, history was made. So, so this is why... <clears throat> I love guests like you who are not celebrity entrepreneurs, but people that, you know, work from the trenches, had exposure. It's some some people work for big companies, but yeah. you said something that's the the one of the nuggets for this podcast. Even though you're surrounded by smart people, that's not necessarily a recipe for success. Absolutely. And, and um, like one of the people that that I follow, he's not a techie. He's a he's a coach for high achieving people his name is rich litvin uh, i love what he says he says that you know if you're the smartest guy in the room you're in the wrong room yeah uh and i think that's the tech industry because i started in it and software development also the tech industry i think always suffered and probably continues to suffer because of the intellectual bandwidth of the people that are in inside the industry yeah they very often think that they are untouchable, that they're smarter than anybody else. That the, stuff that they, the stuff yeah. that they touch. It, it, people refer to doctors having God complex. I think IT guys have whatever the equivalent is of God complex. Right. Yeah. And and they're very difficult to work with because uh, there's never an end point, right? There's always this 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. Mm -hmm. and, and they're not always accepting of criticism and and things that should humble themselves, but that's okay. All right, so so you work for Microsoft, and at least in your timeline, you get an entrepreneurial bug. Yes. And then you leave them, mm -hmm. right? And you start your own thing. Yeah. And so, so the entrepreneurial bug had always been there. Um, I think even during college um, with my eventual and current co-founder, um, we had always talked about different ideas, wanting to work on different things. Um, even while we were at uh, our big company, so uh, so while I was at Microsoft, my co-founder, Justin, he was at HP at the time. Um, we were still in communication. We'd have all these crazy ideas. And we would we saw this pattern where we'd have some crazy idea, say, ah, you know, no one's gonna, not worth it. No one's going to do it. And then we look and someone, someone goes and does it. And then, you know, and then it happened over and over again. We're like, okay, well, at least, at, you know, at least those ideas aren't so bad that someone wasn't working to, wasn't willing to try it. And so at some point, um, you know, it was a good transition point for, for us in our careers. We were the considering B school, like business school at the time. And then, we decided that you know let's let's take a swing at it, and so we uh, got together over one weekend. Um, I mean, this was all remote. This is before remote work was cool, but you know, he was he was in Chicago at the time. I was in I was in Seattle. We got together in person, game planned the whole thing, B planned all like all that stuff, and basically the next day back at work, um, we gave notice and just decided to jump ship. And this was uh, menuism. It was yeah. Yes. So, so, so I have two questions. One, um, it it takes it takes a lot of courage to become an entrepreneur to jump ship. Yeah. yeah. I think it takes special courage when you are in the cocoon of a of a really big company like a Microsoft, and then you elect to leave that for 
the roller coaster ride and the unknown of I want to be absolutely I want to be yeah. on my own. So what what do you remember what got you over that? I mean, I'm sure your parents said, John, you're crazy. You know, we immigrated <laughs> to this country, gave you great life. You went to a good school. You're working for the biggest company in the universe. You're going to leave that. Mm hmm. So, so your question was what got us over the hump? Yeah, it? over the hump of actually, I always call it like cutting, disconnecting from the mothership and then feeling yeah. your face on your own. Um, probably a little bit of alcohol, I would say. <laughs> but also, um, I think the way we looked at it was um, we were doing fine in our careers and we felt that um, one we could take our time, we could take our time and take a swing at this and always be able to go back and try to find another job within industry, right? I, I think we we both were confident that we were at least employable mm -hmm. um, and potentially even more employable after going through, um, through the attempt of starting our own startup. Um, the other way, the other way we saw it is that if we gave it a year, and we failed, we could always try to pivot that and apply to B school, get another job. And so that there would always be something beyond that. Um, and then the, the other thing was also, we looked at it kind of as the, I don't know if you've heard of the regret minimization framework from no. Jeff Bezos. I mean, you, I'm probably completely butchering this, but basically it was look, looking back on your life, trying to think about the things that you would regret. Um, you don't want to have things that you would regret not doing. Right. And so, yes. so definitely we had always been talking about wanting to start a business. So that was absolutely something that we, uh, we said, you know, we're, we were still young at the time, wanted to give it a swing, had, uh, had some savings from our jobs. And so that's what we did. And we definitely game planned the communication strategy with our parents. Uh, we both have immigrant parents. So that yeah, took I, I think, look, it's, uh... Jumping into entrepreneurship and, and thinking if it doesn't work out, I can, I can always go get a job is a really, really bad idea for any entrepreneur. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but in your case, I think in cert there are certain industries where, you know, young, talented, smart guys like like you who have a skill set in something that's in demand everywhere. Yeah, it's a pretty good bet that if it didn't work out, you could you're employable and you'll get a decent job, right? Yeah. One hundred percent. For most of us, that doesn't apply. Yeah, that's yeah. why I tell people uh, yeah, I like true. the I like the burn the boats analogy, right? The general that you know the story, right? Yeah. So you, uh, you know when when you leave the mothership, you burn the boat. You, you just stick to it because if you don't stick to it, eighty percent of entrepreneurship ventures fail. But just at the point right before they're about to make it right before the right. dawn exactly yeah. yep. Just that and and one reason it happens because you talk to yourself into for all, throughout your struggles i can always go get a job yeah uh it it's i think it's something natural that happens to us as a way to reduce the anxiety but you also have to step aside and say okay realistically can i really get a job in my case i was in my 50s when i walked away from something similar to yours but not blue chip company worst time in the world anybody should quit when you put three kids through college, now you're financially relieved of obligations and I can coast till retirement. I always said that I didn't want my tombstone to read, here lies uh, an asshole who didn't have the courage to be an entrepreneur, even though he talked about it all his life. So That's... talk about regrets. I, I knew if I wasn't going to do it then, never going to happen and exactly. it was grueling it i, I yeah. mean it was grueling and yes i was relatively successful had a lot of credibility and told myself well it doesn't work out i could go somebody will hire me because a lot of people know me yeah but that wasn't going to happen because when you leave a six-figure job yeah they replaced you with a junior guy making <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and you're not getting it back at 50 not going to happen so so Talk about menuism for a second, and I want to jump into the a few others. Sure. Um, so what was that about? So um, during this planning process, right before we jumped ship, um, so just touching back on what you said about burning the boats, we we saw leaving, we saw giving notice and severing completely as the burning the boats, because before this point, we had actually tried uh, working remotely, like in nights and weekends on building something, but it was really difficult. And that was where 
you know, you're always like trying to do it as a side job. Um, it didn't work for us. And so that's why that's part of the reason we decided to jump ship completely. Um, during when we were planning, we brainstormed a lot of different ideas. Uh, one of the ideas we had, we had was about shared online calendaring. We saw that someone else had already done it or was starting to do it. That eventually became Google Calendar. Um, and so one of the problems we wanted to solve was that at the time, we had a whole bunch of restaurant menus lying around in our um, you know, in your kitchen drawer at the time, right? You call for takeout and so on. And so we wanted to just try to tackle that problem of being able to put digitize that kind of information and put it online and make it easy for anyone else to be able to reference and like look up look up restaurants and look up things on the at the dish level. And how do you monetize? So so you make every menu available to me online. Yep. Yeah. Right. And how do you how did you monetize it? Was it by subscription? That was an interesting lesson. Um, the initial idea was that we were going to sell services to restaurants. Um, back oh. at the time, very few restaurants were on. We ran into wall after wall on that hypothesis. But the initial idea was that we're going to put, we're going to digitize all these restaurant listings, digitize the menus, sell services to the restaurants, maybe um, related to like diner feedback and so on. Um, that, yeah, that we ran into a wall on that. Restaurant sales were super tough at the time. No one was online. Every restaurant was worried about what happens in the four walls of the restaurant and not so much around uh, you know, the online businesses. What did end up working for us was that we uh, uh, discovered online traffic. So SEO and organic traffic. And so this is pretty, a menuism was built pretty early on and relatively in the web days. We were able to get some pretty good organic traffic for restaurant listings, for dish listings and dish reviews and so on. So we discovered, hey, out of nowhere, we started getting this flow of traffic. And oh, if we put start putting ads on the site, then that is a viable way to monetize. Right. And so the, the monetization strategy was completely 180 degrees different from what we initially had intended. Hmm. Makes sense because the restaurants are also a tough, tough crowd to to work with. Tough business. Really tough. Yeah. Very tough business. It's, it's the business. I mean, again, I'm not going to generalize because I'm not an expert in anything, especially not restaurants, but usually it's the chef that starts the restaurant because he's got a following and he's passionate. Got a style. But to me, a chef is like an artist. Artists are the worst business people in the universe. So yeah. not not easy to go. To, no. and plus, they deal with so much literally like fires all day long literally you know you're literally fighting fires all day if yes if it's not in the kitchen it's in on the front of the house back of the house and the delivery yep. it's it's insane yeah so um let, let's let's fast forward because i want to spend more sure. time on on pickful when did you come up with pickful and and the spelling for my audience is pick as in p-i-c-k f as in frank u how did the name come up and tell me about the concept. How did you get, when did you get to a point when you said the universe needs that? Or the question I'm asking all my people that I, I coach and I mentor and my guests, what problem were you solving with PicFu? Great. Um, PicFu actually came about fairly soon after Menuism. So Justin, my co-founder and myself, we're a team of two. And we were building menuism and both of us are uh, technologists and not designers. So we would always have these internal debates about should it be this color, or this color, this design or that design, this, this tagline or this marketing message or the other. And it's just the two of us. And we, our friends and family were always tired of giving us feedback. So PicFu came about as a way for us. We solved our own problem. Our problem was how do we get unbiased feedback uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, we built PicFu as a tool, as an internal tool first for ourselves to basically break our, uh, help us with our decisions to uh, to be the tiebreaker because our friends and family were tired of giving us feedback, right? And they're super biased. So we'd always be asking them, do you like this? Yeah, of course we like it, right? You're, you know, you're related to us. Of course, of course they're going to say yes. Um, so over one long weekend, uh, we built the prototype for PicFu, which is effectively tapping into, um, tapping into a panel of people, anonymous people in the U S to be able to quickly give feedback on, let's say a versus B versus C, or just sort of open-ended, Hey, what do you think about this? Um, and I think that initial concept was they would pick 
one of two or three options and then write down why. And we discovered that that solved our problem really, really well, right? Because it was the equivalent of going out to a coffee shop and asking a bunch of people for feedback. But, you know, my my parents always told me never to talk to strangers and we're introverts and technologists. So, you know, we're not, we, we everyone, every entrepreneur thinks that they should go, knows that they should go out and talk to potential customers. It's a lot harder to do that in practice, right? And oftentimes the people in your coffee shop or the people who are surrounding you are not your target audience. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that was the problem we faced. And then that's why we built PicFu to solve that problem for ourselves. Um, this was over 10 years ago. Now, we didn't actually think about marketing it. We just thought it was a cool tool for ourselves. We put is, a PayPal. So, yeah. John, just, just for one second, is, is pick foo the short for pick for you? Or what is the foo from? The pick piece, I, I get it. Yeah. Um, what mattered for us in the naming was that it uh, the dot .com domain was available. It was short. It was two syllables and it was memorable. We made a huge lit. We brainstormed a big list of names, and then we pick food it. We ran a whole. We ran a whole bunch of names through PickFu to uh, to get people's reactions to it. And so that's how we decided on PickFu. For us, uh, you know, Pick is helping you choose. Fu is kind of like um, the Fu in Kung Fu. Or at the time, people were saying that if you were really good at Google, you had really good Google Fu at the time. Oh, wow. So Fu implies mastery. So Pick Fu is sort of the mastery of helping you make a, a better decision. So you learn now, something every day. So Kung Fu, the Fu piece is the mastery? Is mastery. So oh. so Kung Fu, the, the literal definition is Kung is uh, work and, and Fu is like mastery. So, All right. So I just want to make sure that that we, we kind of simplify this process for people who are not marketing people necessarily. Yeah. Um, the service that you... So the problem you're solving is giving uh providing independent objective market research resources to people that need to make decisions uh i would guess on any topic but there's probably some buckets of things that repeat themselves right yeah the right way to think about pickfu is that it's a digital focus group like at your okay. fingertips Perfect. yep so it we have a panel of over 10 million now over 10 million people in the US and you can target you can go directly to your target audience and bring your creative your book title your book cover your logo your tagline your business name whatever it is and ask those unbiased people directly mm -hmm. and get their feedback on your marketing collateral and things that matter to your business. So um, I guess, so, so for me, the so we understand the problem you're solving, but again, from an entrepreneurial journey, you, yeah. were, ten, you were 10 million. So without the audience, without your focus groups, the people that make up the focus group, the pick full has no relevance. And so you have to go out and you have to go build a tribe of, of people, people right? that are that are interested and open and willing mm -hmm. to do this. Uh, interestingly, one of my my clients, who are still really good friends, uh, are a recruiting company for focus groups. They nice. do the they do the actual recruiting. Yeah. And, and when I sit there in the office and watch 15, 16 people on the phones and and then I said, oh, that is insane. But they work from a questionnaire mm -hmm. right? that's that's defined by their by the clients who look for specific people. So so my question is, how do you go and find people who are wanting willing to be part of your digital focus group? And do they get paid for this? So Last question first. Yes, they uh, every every panelist gets paid a stipend for answering uh, these polls is what we call them. Um, in terms of building it, we being technologists, we did not go do the recruiting ourselves. We built PicFu on top of existing panels. So there are panels out there. You know, every election season, you see the polls of so and so demographic prefers this candidate over this candidate. Mm -hmm. There is an existing system out there of market research panels, companies, polls, surveys. Um, 
we built a system that ties a whole bunch of them together um, with a layer of demographic targeting. So if you want to target a female who makes over $100,000, who's an Amazon Prime shopper, we can help you do that. Someone who exercises frequently, we can, we can target that. So that layer that stitches all these panels together, we, uh, and that layer enables the targeting. And then it's also a layer of quality because a lot of times people are doing this, these surveys with, uh, you know, looking at their phone, playing a video game, all that other stuff. And so we've built in all these, um, all these automated systems to make sure that people are actually paying attention to whatever it is that you're asking um, and giving really high quality feedback. And I think that's what sets us apart from anything else out there. All right. So, so you work smart, not hard. <laughs> we work hard too, but yeah, yes. Well, but at least the initial piece, you didn't yes. go and, and, and put, I'm going to call them dumb Facebook ads for people to just join in and participate in service and make no. $10, right? You didn't do no. it. You, you took an, an existing, pretty much vetted infrastructure of different, you took, yes. you took the market and then through maybe API or whatever, you're able to use the data, their database at a layer of filtering on top of it. Yes. And then, okay. And the people that you're accessing their information, they get a piece of the action also? They do, yes. Okay. All right, so, so that it's, a, it's a beautiful model where it's a win-win for everyone, right? Everyone they, wins, yeah. They, and generally, you know, and we... I mean, the panelists matter a lot to pick food. We, uh, we constantly pull them ourselves to make sure that they're happy and, you know, and, um, fairly compensated for, for their time. And so it's, it's a win-win for everyone. Yeah. And, and again, I love what you just said, because, um, I, I guess you, we can, we can dump you into the SaaS universe, right? Software as a service kind yeah. of. Right? Yes. And, mm -hmm. and my, my biggest pet peeve you'll hear in every podcast when I talk to people is that with SaaS founders. Uh, that 98% of them make this the cardinal sin of business. They, all they do is chase subscribers so that one day they can go to somebody and sell the company off because they have this great MRR, AIR stuff. And yeah. in the process, the cardinal sin they commit is they completely neglect the subscribers. And then they wind up with churn and then they whine and bitch and moan why people left them. And they mm -hmm. leave them because they didn't do what you do. Stay in touch with the survey takers. Your your you without them you can't do anything. Yeah, exactly. You make sure that they're okay. That that there's a relationship that you build, and it's critical. Yeah. For the future of your company, but also to to have people in your system that are actively engaged for the purpose that you fulfill. For people that want to use the service, right? So if exactly. I want, if I want to ask John Lee a question about my book, I'd rather that John Lee would answer it after looking and thinking about it, not just get it over with because he just made ten bucks, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So that's the yeah. key. And for full disclosure, uh, uh, you didn't know that I used Pickful, but I, I did not, not at all. <laughs> and I used Pickful in 2021 when I worked on my my latest book, and I won't talk about it because I'm very careful. I don't, I don't ever self-promote anything, but I was very, I was struggling with the title of the book a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I had one title of mine, which had a negative word in it, the, the word mistakes. And then I had other ones and, and literally the book was done and I spent four months really, really torturing myself with feedback from people that I knew. Uh -huh. But what, because the title is key. The title is absolutely key. I mean, your the title, absolutely. The, yes. The, the design of your cover and your title and then the subtitle is what sells books. And very often, particularly if you, if you decide to marry into the Amazon universe, it's a, it's a quick thing, right? Boom. Yeah. Yeah. The, the design captures me, then the title, then I read the book summary. And if it's there, it's there. And I was, I was really tortured and I don't remember how I came across Pig Fu, but it was a liberating process Good to be able to go to complete strangers. Cause you're right. When you ask people that know you, some of them will say what you want to hear yeah. and others will challenge you, but not in a productive way. Right. So they're, so you, you call them, I mean, going to the randos, which is it's the randos. Yes, right? absolutely. The randos, as long as they are within your your 
target audience and for me as people that are interested in in marketing and entrepreneurship yeah. uh yes let's get their feeling and it was very helpful because it's um it's really frustrating and i mean in this case a book title will make or make you will make or break your book absolutely right a hundred percent will do it and i can always publish it and then four months later decide i can decide to change it and do it again but that's not that's not the right way to do this mm -hmm. um what's it, uh, maybe it's a stupid question what's the number one the most popular survey that people ask on pickfu so before i touch on that um when you first mentioned at the right before we got into this conversation that you had used it before uh, i did do i did go in and try to pull up uh, see if i could find your poll and i i am looking at it now because what you just mentioned about the negative connotation i see what you're saying about the the book yeah. title and everything and yeah, yeah it was i hope you, you know, got some but, good feedback there but, yeah but, but yeah i did but honestly yeah. you know this you look at some books, there's one book in particular, and I, I just had a podcast with the guy who wrote it, and he's actually incredibly brilliant. But his book is the, I think it was called The Art of Not Giving an F, right? Oh, yep. Michael something, I think. Yeah, and it's F asterisk yep. CK, right? Yeah. Um, and he said that, that initially publishers didn't want to touch him because, you know, uh, putting that word on the cover is insane, right? Yeah. But he is mega successful. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of people that would not buy the book because of that word. Right. Uh, my book was was for for entrepreneurs and small business owners. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was struggling. the The word I was going to use was exactly how I felt about yeah. what they were doing and how the book is solving for them. But there was a piece of me that said, "Okay, you can be holier than the Pope and lose." Or maybe we can find a a happy medium between all that stuff. But yeah. I, I literally it was four months of of sheer torture to and and it's yeah. a big decision. So go ahead. So what's is there? What what are the top three things that people come to you for? Sure. Um. So bi business entrepreneurs and business people come to pick Fu to get unbiased feedback to validate from their target market, right? To validate their decisions. Um, publish people in publishing, people who are self-publishing, who are publishing their books, um, they love, we see a lot of self-publishing authors testing book titles and book covers. Uh, we see a lot of software and game developers testing their concepts before they launch right? Because you put in a lot of time, just like books, you put in a lot of time and effort into developing these stories, these characters, these products before putting it out in the world. If you can test with your target market in the development phase, that increases your chances of success once you actually launch, mm -hmm. right? So that, so it's that pattern over and over again. Um, our biggest vertical is actually e-commerce. People who are selling things online and particularly people who are selling on Amazon. So as you said on Amazon, it's a competitive marketplace. What matters is the image, the title, uh, the image, the title, and then the reviews, right? And so the um, being able to win that click on Amazon when a potential customer is comparing your product versus another product is absolutely critical to the success to the success of your business and your product. Pickfu helps. Amazon sellers win that click better by optimizing those listing images, those titles, bullet points, descriptions, all of that stuff. So those are some pretty major categories of different verticals that use PicFu. Yeah, I think a lot of people just I don't. I, a lot of people don't know that Amazon it's it's almost like a separate reality. It's a it's a absolutely it's another galaxy somewhere that operates independently of Google, anything else. Mm -hmm. um, you're the techie guy, but from my, my knowledge is they actually have the best search engine in the universe. They have an amazing search engine. Internally, which they have to. Um, so when, when I was studying self-publishing and, and the marketing and studying the Amazon universe for six months and bought a couple of products to identify keywords and all the other stuff, um, I decided that not, not going to happen for me because mm -hmm. it's just too complicated. It is really, uh, really it's complicated. complicated. And if you're yeah, up yeah. against people with deep pockets, um, 
you're going to lose. And for me, when I launched the book, I did some things that you're supposed to do in the pre-launch and, and marketing yeah. events. And for the first three days, I was what, what I knew what this time would meant. I was a hot new seller. Mm -hmm. And which meant that for a few days, I was the number one seller in my, in the categories because I did the marketing correctly. Yeah. And then I noticed that the number one book in one of the categories, the book I read and didn't think too much of as a marketing guy, but the the marketing machine that he has behind him and the amount of money that he spends on a monthly basis on Amazon, which is around $2,000 a month on ads. Yeah. First of all, I can't match that. And secondly, it doesn't make any economic sense to spend that kind of money to sell a book that on Kindle is $2.99 and hardcover is $9.95. Yep. Right? You're going to lose your shirt. Mm -hmm. The reason they do it is because the book is just a lead magnet to sell high-end coaching and high-end courses other. and all the other stuff. So at the end of the day, your cost acquisition cost relatively very low if that's what they wind up buying. Yeah. So, it's it is um as a, it's a jungle to sell on Amazon. Um yeah, and we've that this is Pickfu is one tool that helps Amazon sellers. There's many many other tools and there's many other facets about selling on Amazon that are super super complicated. I would yeah. not go into that. Um um and honestly, you can be a you can be a category leader on Amazon one day and then be usurped by somebody else on another day and watch your revenue plummet at any time and um Winners and losers change all the time on Amazon. And I think the only long-term winner is Amazon, I guess. Well, yeah. And and yeah. the fact that and, and I guess the consumer that, too, that they're they're they have the ability to have this selection. I think the insane part is that if I come if I want to and I and I tested Amazon ads for a month and then I said, yeah. okay, this is not gonna work. Um the insane part is that you promote your own book and it shows up, but right below it. They say, "Oh, you might be also interested in absolutely the guy, yes. the guy that I can't stand because I think his book sucks, but I can't compete with four thousand five star reviews." Yep, right? Yep, That's yep, it, yep. no brainer. So, um, I still feel like Seth Godin that I, a good idea spread and organic spread of of a good thing long term is the right way to do things. Uh, although Agreed. if you want, but if you want to monetize and scale up, you can't just sit and wait for that to happen. Yeah. Uh, at this podcast, I committed to spending not a penny on marketing it. Uh, I want people to talk about it. And if they like my guests and they like my style, they'll share it. And it's beginning to work. People are pitching me to be, to be guests. And that's awesome. Those are people with good followers. They're not, yeah. as, as you call them, Rando that said, oh, can I be on your podcast? Yeah. Uh, equally, there are people that pitch me, and the first question is, "How many listeners do you have? How many followers do you have?" And my answer is, "Why do you care?" It doesn't matter, right? Right? Because if yeah. you want, if you want to play the John Lee Dumas top ten iTunes thing, I'm only going to bring you in if you have a hundred thousand plus my two million, and we cross pollinate. Yeah. This nonsense. As if that's the, if that's your game, I'm not for you. Not interested. Yeah. Yeah. I'm exactly. I'm absolutely a nobody. I'm not going to help you at all. Yeah. So, exactly. um. So John, you you did the Microsoft gig, and then the rest of it's all entrepreneurship. It's all been entrepreneurship. And, yep. And in looking back, if you were to now give your son, who's about to apply to college, and I'm making stuff up because I yep. don't know if you have, it, but <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll pretend that your son was applying to college. Yeah. Uh, is saying to you, but dad, you went to Berkeley and then you quit. You went to Meyer, and then you quit. <laughs> right? What do you tell him? I have not set myself up for good parenting here with with my own life story, huh? Um, I would say uh, I would say to take calculated risks and just make sure that you're learning everything you can along the way, and that nothing is a failure unless you're. Uh, it's only a failure if you haven't learned a thing. So when when you look back, we we all kind of look at our entrepreneur journey and we have these nightmare scenarios the, the those moments where you either screaming internally or out of the, or you just went for a long run because you were just about to rip your hairs out and or yeah, put yeah. a bullet in your head um did you have one of those moments and how did you get over that um 
<laughs> as as an entrepreneur, I'm sure you know you know that the uh, the emotional roller coaster is crazy mm -hmm. um, during the entrepreneurial journey. Um, we've had a number of them, particularly with uh, I guess earlier on with manualism. I think we were as technologists building a new piece of technology that we did not have a lot of background with. We made a whole bunch of mistakes that were um, fairly existential for the business just in terms of like configuring something incorrectly or whatever stories for another time. Um, I think that made us, uh, we did a lot of long runs and then we did a lot of retrospectives on, you know, where do we make this mistake? What are the things like, how do we not, uh, how do we not stay blind to, to these kinds of risks? So I think, um, We've basically gone through business building the hard way, like through the school of hard knocks instead of going to B school or something like that. Um, so we've definitely made plenty of mistakes along the way. And I think we just try to have the attitude of, okay, well, that was a pretty bad, you know, that was a pretty bad situation. How do we avoid that next time? And like try to file that away and um, as we move forward. Yeah, I think I think some some entrepreneurs blame everybody else. Some entrepreneurs yeah. just choke it up to luck and the economy and <clears throat> whatever. Yes. Um, I think the ones that make it happen are uh, you sort of like the role model where first the humility to admit that we screwed up. Then, okay, let's identify what did we do wrong. We learn from it. We try not to repeat it and you keep going, right? Yep. So it's like in the universe of, Japanese culture and manufacturing system that I learned for many years. It's a continuous improvement process. Exactly. But in order to have a continuous improvement culture, which is a mindset, you have to be humble. You have to recognize that you're not the smartest person in a room and that you screw up, that you're yeah. human, and it's okay, right? It's okay. Perfect. Part that. of the process. You look, you look at your friends at Microsoft, and I don't want to beat them up because I'm an Apple guy. But <laughs> in all the years that I've used Microsoft products in the corporate world, everything, it was really an awful product. I mean, the yes. constant constant rebooting and errors and device connections. And I, I remember, I don't know, you probably don't even know, that my first laptop was a compact portable two. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, was, I think I do have, yeah. It was a, it was a compact, the, the brilliant, right? They came up yeah. with a portable computer yep. that looked like a suitcase fit perfectly under the seat. Mm -hmm. And then you load it up with floppy disk, which most yeah. people don't even know, right? <laughs> so, but it was a, a, a Microsoft operating system and I would fly out to demo pieces of software that we sold yeah. for fifty to $200,000 to Fortune 500. Yeah, and I would bomb in the middle of the presentation, and you do it, just crap. Yeah. Uh, it, it was just it was grueling. And then then connection issues, and I then laptop showed up, and I'm I'm in Europe, and I can't get this. And finally, I said, "That's it." And I went to a Mac, and I'm sorry, but all my problems went away. So oh, so was, we switched. Oh, we switched to Apple after I left Microsoft. Yeah. Like but after. but here's an example. I yeah. think I think Microsoft. I don't use their products, but I think it sounds like they probably got their act together and yes. products at a much higher level, less incidents of issues, but it's the complexity of the software, the debugging, the constant, yeah. the constant errors. All right. So John, we're let's do a quick rapid fire. Sure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll a few questions to you. Just one answer. You don't have to yeah. Cry about the answer if it's touchy, but anyway. So, yeah. all right, one one person that influenced you the most, um, my dad, for uh, showing me what uh, high quality looks like. Perfect. Uh, best advice you've ever received? Yeah, um, most people overestimate what they can do in a short time, but underestimate what they can achieve in the long run. And. You don't get to use this for my next question, but if you had a billboard in Times Square, what would you put on it? Um, probably a reminder for everyone to uh, stop and smell the roses. Humility, right? Huh? Uh, get, get grounded yeah. and, and be humble. Yeah. Get grounded. Get grounded. Like, yeah. Um, one book that changed your life? Uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, actually. Okay, so I don't know what's about, I'll admit. So what's that about? Um, 
it's a it's a anthropology book about the evolution of human different human cultures over history mm. um like why is it that western culture pervaded you know we had the egyptians we had the greeks we had the romans like how is it that the world today is dominated by western culture the insight there is that geography and the surroundings and the environment influence the way that humans evolved and cultures evolved and the reminder for me after reading that is that um so much of what affects our lives is not about us but about our surroundings the people we spend our time with the environments we put ourselves in um, and i think that applies to both on a personal level and on a business level as well so i think that always pervades like how i think about things you know what's what's amazing in what you just said is, is is I love Asian culture. I studied Japanese culture in college, even though I was a psych major. Mm -hmm. uh, based on what you just said, it's it's the non-Western slash Asian cultures that should dominate the world because there's so much good stuff that's in those cultures, right? Ah, uh, you got to read the book to understand why that didn't happen. Okay, I'm I'm yeah. not gonna have to do it because to me it's it's. Yeah, uh, the the value system that we have here is so different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and to me, that's what. Anyway, well, yeah. uh, I, I mean, I will... growing up as a product of both, it's always been in like philosophy and sort of cult value systems and cultures has always been really interesting to me because I kind of grew up on both sides of it, like seeing both okay. sides of it. So yeah. All right, last question. Um, since I'm I'm reading you in San Francisco, so you must be a fit guy. You probably <laughs> run. You probably run a lot. Uh, what song would you admit to either singing loud while you while you run or in the shower? Um, <laughs> um, bye 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 by Insync. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's perfect. All right. Um, I hope enough people that know you're going to listen to this and give you a hard time. <laughs> and just yeah, just rid me for it forever, right? Yeah, that's all right. All right. Yeah. So, John, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's personal pleasure for me to meet somebody who's a co-founder of something that I've used that actually helped me in my book publishing. Wonderful. Um, anybody needs some independent bias, unbiased advice on different topics? Pick Fu is a really cool platform. Uh, and I'll, I'll include how they can connect with you. But if you put John, there's quite a few John Lees on, on LinkedIn, but go look for pick Fu, pick F U, which is yep. mastery. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you'll run into John. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, it's been a pleasure and I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I appreciate the time, Zev. It's been a pleasure. Same here.